Hello everyone, welcome back to another book to game comparison video. Today I am going to be looking at the Nancy Drew game, The Deadly Device, and the two books that it is based on. So the first book we'll be looking at is In and Out of Love from the Nancy Drew on Campus series, and it was published in 1997. And this is the first and only time that a game has been based off of an on-campus book. The second book we'll look at is The Crime Lab Case, which was published in 2002 and is part of the Nancy Drew Digest paperback series. And then together, these two books make up The Deadly Device, which was released in 2012. So before I jump into things, I did want to give a few notes. The first is, of course, a spoiler warning because I spoil things right away. So that includes the culprits, obviously, as well as specific events that happen in the books and the game. So if you don't want any of that spoiled for you, I suggest not watching or listening to this video just yet. Maybe read the books first, play the game first, and then come back to me here. <laughs> and then the second note is actually a trigger warning, uh, simply due to some of the content that does come up. And for those who sort of want to be prepared for what that is, in case you feel that you might be okay with watching but aren't sure, uh, the first topic of the two is murder. That's going to come up in the game as well as one of the books. So, you know, consider yourself forewarned if that's a sensitive topic for you. And the second one is suicide. This does come up in one of the books. So if this is something that you don't want to be around or hear about, um, please do not continue with the video. I don't want to trigger anyone and please do seek help if you need it, you know, someone to talk to. Uh, for those of you who live in Canada back in November 2023, so just a few months ago, a National Suicide Crisis Helpline was launched and that number is 988. So just like 911, 811, it's a simple three-digit toll-free number. Again, that's 988. So if you need to talk to someone, please dial that. Or if you know of someone who may need to speak with someone, uh, please be sure to pass that on. For those listening and watching from other countries, unfortunately, I don't have those numbers available to you, but I hope that you are able to access those services wherever you may be. So with that in mind, let's look into the first book. So this is, again, In and Out of Love of the Nancy Drew on Campus series. It's book number 22, and that's actually fairly late in the series. And I'm not going to be talking about the whole book. Um, I don't know how many of you have read any of the on campus books, but they follow multiple storylines. So there's always Nancy solving a mystery, but then it also focuses on other students. So it could be some of her sweet mates, her friends, you know, often Bess and or George have a story of their own. This one certainly focuses on Bess a bit. Uh, there's also a focus on Nancy's ex-boyfriend. There's also a new student. So I'm not going to go over those details because they do not pertain to the game. So I'm only going to talk about Nancy's storyline, which does relate to the deadly device. So Nancy has a friend named Gary Friedman, and she and him work together at Wilder Times. That's the paper on campus. And they had planned to meet. They're working on a few stories together, and Gary doesn't show up. And she knows he's been having a really hard time sleeping. Uh, his roommate is a bit difficult for him. He's, uh, he's always up late studying and he has a Walkman on and he hums along to it all the time. So Gary sometimes doesn't even sleep in his dorm. Nancy's found him at uh, the Walder Times office a couple of times sleeping there. Um, but he's not there this morning. She thinks that's a bit odd. And so she has to call the sports team she's going to meet up, meet up with to postpone. And she's wandering and then she sees a crowd. And here's an ambulance and discovers that an accident has happened. And as she approaches, she sees Gary's body. And it looks like he's fallen out of his dorm window as he's on the ground outside of his dorm building. And he was on the third or fourth floor. And unfortunately, he has died. And Nancy has a really hard taking this in. She can't believe that Gary would jump. And that's what a lot of people think is that he died by suicide. And one of the reasons she can't believe this is because his camera is found near his body. And why would he jump with his camera? That just doesn't make sense. She also knows that he's been very excited lately. He's just started a new relationship with a girl he's had a crush on since freshman orientation. And he'd recently won an award in photography. He had so many things to look forward to. And she just can't reason that with this action. 
And so then she goes up to the dorm and wants to explore and investigate, but she can't. There's a police officer there. But she leans her head in and she sees a suicide note. And so she's then conflicted, but only briefly because she reads it and she is very aware of the language used, the word choice, and it doesn't sound like Gary. So this further motivates her to look into what happened to her friend because she cannot believe that he chose to jump out of the window. She doesn't think it's genuine. So she now starts investigating his life and the people he was involved with. And she looks into the girl he's just started to date, his roommate and the ex-boyfriend of the girl that he was seeing. So the characters for this storyline include, of course, Gary Friedman. So this is the photographer and friend of Nancy who has died. Then there's Trevor McLean, and that was Gary's roommate. And he seems very upset about what's happened to Gary. Then we have Mara Linden, who had just gone on one date with Gary, and he was very excited about her, and she seemed to, to feel very inspired by him. And then there's Sean Masters, who used to date Mara, and is very protective and possessive and can be rather violent. And so Nancy's trying to figure out who could have a motive and, you know, Sean comes to mind because of this threatening behavior, but then she learns of an alibi for him. And this is actually through Mara. And Mara confesses that she cancelled her last date with Gary and she was with Sean. And not for anything romantic, but to talk things through and to really end things but it meant that she wasn't involved and neither was Sean and that sort of left Trevor or some other other person who Nancy hadn't thought of and then she remembers the camera she'd found Gary's camera and meant to bring it to the police because she thought this not only was it just evidence but a big clue and very very telling uh, that it didn't make sense for Gary to have jumped and she finds that there's a roll of film inside it so she takes it to the photo lab in the university and she develops the film and the very last photo he took is a blurry shot and she recognizes the cap of the person in the picture and it's Trevor the roommate so she takes this photo to the dean who then calls in Trevor and Trevor confesses but not to murder he admits that he and Gary were play fighting and Gary accidentally fell out the window so this was a tragic accident but Trevor twisted it he'd heard a rumor that if his roommate died by suicide he would automatically earn a 4.0 GPA and Trevor's been so studious so focused on the schoolwork that he decides to twist it to his advantage and writes this fake suicide note but he feels guilty about it and it's just a truly tragic storyline you know, it was an accident, and I got twisted, but it could have all been resolved very quickly. It's a very somber story. It's it's very sad. Uh, so let's move on to one that's also a little heavy, but not quite as bad. <laughs> so this is the Crime Lab case. It's book number 165 of the Nancy Drew Mystery Stories, also often referred to as the Digest Paperbacks. So in this book, Nancy is helping out with a science camp for high school students at the university in Westmore. And she winds up having to take charge because the lead professor, Charles Paris, gets poisoned and falls into a coma. So now Nancy has to work on this fake crime for these high school students to solve while also trying to solve a real crime. And fortunately for her, Ned, Bess, and George are also helping out with the science camp, so they're able to help her as well with her case. And they're having a hard time trying to untangle clues. Which clues that were in this box from the professor are for the science camp, and which ones actually relate to this real life case? And not only do they, you know, discover obviously that he's been poisoned, but they find clues to suggest that he's been blackmailed. So this has Nancy looking up a few things, you know, who's poisoned him, who's blackmailed him, are they the same person? She suspects that they probably are, but she now has to figure out a motive. And again, trying to figure out what clues are real clues, what's not just dirt and debris, what are clues for the camp, what's for her case, it, it all gets a little bit muddled and confused. 
And along with that, she has to deal with these shadowy figures she sees a couple of times at the professor's office. There's been a break-in also at the office and in her own garage. She's been attacked. George has been attacked. Ned's been attacked. There's a lot of attacks. And then someone who's disguised himself, who Nancy doesn't recognize, but when he sees her, she she's sure he recognizes her. So it all becomes very confusing. And she also has to ask the question, is there only one culprit? Is there more than one? And again, what's the motivation? So we have quite a few characters. Um, we're not going to look at any of the students because they're not suspects in the case. Uh, we have Professor Charles Paris. So he is our victim. Uh, he is a very well-known and respected scientist who's been poisoned. And Nancy later discovers he's also been receiving blackmail threats. We then have his niece, Christy, who only recently connected with him. Uh, she also works on the Faculty of Science at the University of Westmore with him, but she doesn't actually know him that well. And she's also helping with the crime lab camp. Then there's Connor Brandon, who is the deputy for Charles's research project. Uh, he's also helping out with the crime lab case, um, or the camp rather. Then we have Detective Hill Trubin, who is another good friend of Charles, or so he thinks. He also doesn't actually know that much about his friend Charles, it turns out. Uh, and he has many contacts, so he's able to help Nancy with gathering information. Then there's Rosalia or Leah Nestino, who is a forensic geologist who is also helping out with the crime lab camp. And then there's Alexander Kabrov, who doesn't come up initially, but his name comes up as the investigation unfolds. And he is someone who had a bit of a a tiff <laughs> with Charles over patents. And then there's Shep Jackson or S. Jackson as he first comes up. And this is someone who Nancy doesn't know. And uh, is a little bit surprised when she unearths the identity of Shep Jackson. So as she is again muddling her way through different clues and incidents and attacks, what she finally unearths is that Charles Paris was born Shep Jackson. But when his mom married his stepfather, he changed his name to Charles Paris. But then he moved back to Australia to go to school and he went back to the name Shep Jackson. And while he was at school there, he was accused of murder. But he was not charged. He always maintained his innocence. And when he moved back to the States, he then went back to the name of Charles Paris because he didn't want people associating him with this incident that he claims to have been innocent of. And Leah somehow learned about his past and she chooses to blackmail him because she could use the money and she can't understand why someone who's prestigious but did something horrible could continue to do well. So she takes advantage and blackmails him. And then she learns that he plans to look into who's blackmailing him. So she then poisons him. And then, of course, Nancy unearths this information in the end. So that's the crime lab case. So some mysteries, multiple mysteries, some confusion um, about identities and uh, a motivation of, uh, of just money, really. So now let's look at the game. So this is game number 27, The Deadly Device. And for this case, Nancy is tasked with solving a murder at a remote research facility in Colorado. So she right away has a case she's working on. She doesn't stumble into one. And because it's so remote, she winds up staying on site, which is very useful for her. This way she can question suspects who work on different shifts. Uh, she's able to learn about who gets along and who doesn't. And she's also able to snoop around their different work areas while they're not on shift. But she also encounters quite a few terrifying incidents. You know, there's some, uh, some trouble with the Tesla coil. She gets locked into the photolithography lab and there's no air circulating, which was not the person's intent. They didn't know that was happening, but it becomes a very deadly situation for Nancy. And she really learns about the true power and danger of electricity as she's investigating this murder. And of course, learning about Tesla coils and learning about Nico's research and Nico being the victim of murder. So the characters at the lab are first and foremost Niko Jovic, our murder victim, who was uh, very protective of his research, but also felt it should be shared publicly. There's Victor Lawsett, who's the co-owner of Technology for Tomorrow Today Building, uh, who worked with Niko. There's Greg Courtright, who is head of security and uh, not very talkative. There's Ellie York. She works the night shift with Gray and... Uh, 
uh, is the one who found Nico's body. Next, there's Mason Quinto, who shares office space with Ellie, but works the opposite shift. He's there during the day, uh, and he and Ellie don't get along, and he seems to be fine with that. And then there's Ryan Kilpatrick, who is the one who is suspected by police, as well as seemingly from Victor, of committing the murder. So Ryan is sort of the initial main suspect of this case, because she had helped wire the machine for Nico. But she's been framed for his death. Her innocence is proven. And once it's proven, Ellie and Mason are then set up to take the fall. And what we learned is that the true murderer was Victor. And he had expected complete ineptitude from Nancy. He didn't think she was actually going to achieve anything and truly be able to solve this case. And that's actually why he brought her on. He knew that a murder case wouldn't just go away. So he wanted a quick re- quick resolution. He wanted Ryan to be found guilty. And he thought Nancy would do that for him. But she didn't. Instead, she proved her innocence instead of the fake guilt that Victor was creating for her. And the reason that uh, Victor murdered Nico is, as sort of mentioned already, is that Nico thought the public should be able to have free access to their research. Victor did not like that idea. He wanted this priceless, I don't even want to call it a product, but this priceless entity uh, to be sold. This was all for financial gain. And that is, in essence, the game The Deadly Device. So with that, we can now do a proper comparison between the three mediums. And we'll start by looking at titles. So for the books, we have In and Out of Love and The Crime Lab Case, and then the game The Deadly Device. So clearly no overlap with our titles. Uh, so looking at the first one, the on-campus book, In and Out of Love, that title wouldn't work because it doesn't fit the story of the game. And because the book has multiple storylines, it's a suitable title when you look at all of that together. But looking just at the story of Nancy looking into Gary's death, it's not suitable. So that wasn't going to work for a game title. Then looking at the Crime Lab case, that is a better fit. Um, it does focus on being at a laboratory. However, her interactive did change it a little bit. Uh, they've given it, you know, this alliteration for title, the deadly device, and it really focuses on the machinery that led to the death of Nico. So they've changed the focus a little bit, um, which suited the game. So even though I think the crime lab case would have worked, uh, her interactive did al- change the title, which allowed it to focus a bit more on the essence of the story and the murder. So that makes sense. And with that, um, and we'll see in a moment when I go over storyline, the deadly device as a title just better suits the idea of the storyline because it it doesn't follow the books that precisely. So with that, let's look at storylines. So for our first book, um, Nancy's friend has passed and she doesn't believe that he completed suicide. So she seeks the truth behind his fall. And so we don't have any of that in the game. Uh, For the second book, Nancy's helping to solve a real crime of poisoning as well as blackmail at this crime lab camp where she's also overseeing this fake crime uh, that high school students get to try to solve. So we do have, you know, a little bit of similarity in terms of Nancy being at sort of a lab, the science facility and trying to solve a case. The game, that's, yeah, that's kind of similar. Nancy's asked to investigate a murder at a laboratory. So our setting is very similar, but the specific crime is different. Poisoning and blackmail versus murder. So, you know, some overlap a little bit with the second book in the game. And then our locations are different, but kind of similar as well. So the first book takes place at Wilder University, and we don't actually know where that is. The community is not stated. We know it's not far from River Heights. The second game, uh, sorry, the second book is at Westmore University. So we've got two universities for our books, and presumably in the community called Westmore. They don't actually state that outright. It's also near River Heights. The game, however, takes place at the Technology of Tomorrow Today building in Colorado. So it is in a different part of the state. So we know that River Heights and these nearby universities are not uh, in Colorado. So different locations, but they're all sort of set at a lab or involve a lab to some degree. Uh, In and Out of Love is not really focused on a science lab, but it does get referenced. And I'll talk a bit about that uh, further on. 
Um, but we do have otherwise overlap with science labs for the crime lab case and the deadly device. So now let's talk characters. There's not a lot of overlap with characters. Uh, there, there are a few, um, but not many. Um, it's a bit of a stretch with them, as, uh, as we'll see. So we'll start by going over the first book, then the second book, and then the game, and where there's overlap, we'll just see those as they initially come up. So again, starting with the first book, In and Out of Love, we start with Gary, who is a photographer for Wilder Times, and he he struggled with sleeping in his dorm. Uh, he's also recently started seeing this girl, Mara Linden, who's had a crush on for a very long time. Um, and then he winds up dead. So Nancy is investigating his death. Um, and we could say there's, you know, similarity with his name as far as Gary and Gray uh, from the game. But I mean, they're not the same character. So I haven't bothered to say that, um, that they're similar. The second character from this book is Trevor. He is the roommate of Gary and he's really high strung. He's very studious and he claims to have been in the science lab when Gary fell. That's his alibi and we see his name on the entry log for the lab. But in truth, he had to leave the building early and got back to his dorm and he and Gary were messing around playfully and Gary accidentally fell from the window. So Trevor is you could say the culprit even though it was an accident um, but he did write the suicide note to make it look like suicide the other two characters from the book are mara and sean so mara is a love interest of gary they'd gone on a date uh, which they were both very excited about uh, but she used to date this guy named sean masters who isn't the nicest guy and she initially doesn't give an alibi for the time of gary's death and it's because she's a bit embarrassed and doesn't want people to think badly of her. But she was with Sean the night before and that morning. And not in any romantic sense, but they were talking things out and sort of firmly ending their former relationship. And then speaking of Sean, so he's the ex-boyfriend of Mara. He's very jealous of Gary and he threatens anyone who keeps Mara away from him. And this is a big part of why he is high on Nazi's suspect list initially. Because he's he's fearsome, he's very scary, he's threatening. He's very possessive, and Nancy bears witness to this, as do her friends who relate to her. Uh, and he's been known to be physically violent with others, so you know he probably could push Gary, but as we know, he didn't. So those are the characters from the first book, and again, there's no overlap with them. Now if we look at the second book, we're going to see our first bit of overlap. Yay! So we have Charles Paris Orr, Shep Jackson one of his names, and Nico Jovic. So this is the victim, who we could say is a secretive man of science. So in the second book, The Crime Lab Case, Charles was poisoned and blackmailed. And this was because he was accused of murder in Australia when uh, he was using the name Shep Jackson. Um, and he claims he was innocent of this crime, but someone found out about this and is using that information to blackmail him. And then they decide they're going to get kind of get rid of him, poison him, when he decides to look into his blackmailer. Now in the game, Nico has a secret office and he worries about the work of his co-workers. You could say he's often checking in. He's particularly worried about what Mason is getting involved in. And he's murdered because of his belief about free access to the wireless transfer of energy, which is the project that they're working on at the lab. So our overlap really is partly because of their secretive nature. And I should say with Charles, he was very secretive about um, his former identity as uh, Shep Jackson. He sort of wrote about Shep in code, which made it seem like as someone else. So they're both secretive people, um, but both ultimately meant to be good people and they are the victims. So a book only character that we're going to see here is Charles's niece, Christy, and she's only recently become acquainted with her uncle, the professor, and actually doesn't know much about his background. And she's helping with the camp and is able to help Nancy out. And she's the one who asks Nancy to look into things and to take the lead when Charles uh, becomes uh, poisoned and falls into the coma. Now we have another little bit of overlap. It's Again, this is a little bit of a stretch. Uh, it's between Connor and Mason, so they're both co-workers of the victim. So looking again at the crime lab case, Connor is the deputy for Charles's research project. 
and um, is also helping out with the crime lab camp. And Charles entrusted a secret to him, and that was that he was being blackmailed. And Connor doesn't want anyone to know about this. He doesn't want anyone to find out about it. He's trying to keep this secret for Charles. So he sneaks into Charles's office a couple of times to look for the evidence. And um, then he you know, bumps into Ned and Nancy, and he leaves his own evidence behind. And And he doesn't know if he can trust Nancy. And again, this is because he's trying to keep that secret for Charles. Um, but in the end, he, he tells the truth because he's been caught. Uh, but ultimately, he's not a bad guy. He's trying to protect his friend. So his counterpart for the game is Mason. And Mason hates that Nico would access his research and use it without his permission. So they did not get along. So that's kind of different between Connor and Charles. Mason and Nico were kind of budding heads. Uh, but they did work together. Uh, and Mason was also framed by Victor after Ryan's innocence was proven. And, you know, we could say, too, that Nancy questioned Connor as a suspect. And, again, Mason looked like he could be guilty as well. So a little bit of overlap between those characters. And then um, we're going to go back to book-only character for a moment. <laughs> we're kind of doing some back and forth here. So next is Hill Trubin. So he's a detective friend of Charles. And basically he's helping Nancy and her friends uncover the truth about the poisoning and the blackmail. And this is because he has all these contacts through his years of working in science and detecting. So he's a great resource for Nancy. So now we go back to another overlap. It's amazing that this actually happens. Um, this is between Leah from the book and Victor from the game. So a co-worker in the case of Leah and a co-owner in the case of Victor with the victim. So in the book, again, this is the second book, The Crime Lab Case, Leah is a forensic geologist. And she learns about Charles's past under the name Shep Jackson. And she chooses to blackmail him. And this is because she could use the money. And she just thinks it's unfair that a man who is accused of a crime could be successful and so well known in his field. And when she learns that he plans to dig into his blackmailer, she decides to poison him so that she's not caught out. So she, yeah, she's basically our culprit. In the game, Victor murders Nico, and this is also for financial gain. Uh, he wants to sell the process of wireless electricity transmission to the world. Like it's this priceless entity product. I don't really know what you want to call it. Uh, whereas Nico wants to give it away freely. So that's not going to work for Victor. So he killed his partner. So yes, those are those are the culprits from the second book in the game. And that's where we see overlap, especially with that motivation of money. And then the last character we'll look at from the book is named Alexander. He's an old nemesis of Charles. Um, and they had this feud about patents. And Alexander never forgave Charles. Uh, Charles had filed a patent first. And Alex, you know, basically claimed it stole the idea afterward and you know Charles proved that it was his idea and uh, Alex doesn't really want to give up that grudge <laughs> and then he's recently returned to Westmore to check in on his enemy uh, he actually snuck into the hospital not to do anything malicious but he knew that if um, if people saw and knew who he was you know they'd suspect the worst so he disguised himself and uh, and he has a bit of a run-in with Nancy there as well as at her house he sneaks into her garage to sort of warn her off stalking him uh, but ultimately he didn't perpetrate any of the crimes and now we can look at the last few characters from the game that haven't already come up so these are game only characters and there are three of them so we've got gray he's head of security at the laboratory and he was brought on by nico and it's a bit strange that he works in security given that he has a degree in theoret theoretical physics uh, he's actually got a doctorate uh, so he's a very smart man, very scientific, but he's working in security. Uh, and Nancy learns that he argued, and it almost seems like he threatened Nico. But ultimately, he was just trying to watch out for him. And uh, although he's not very talkative with Nancy, he does sort of let on that he suspects, you know, something more to this case. And he wants to help uncover the truth about what happened to his friend. Then we'll look at Ellie. She is also a co-worker of Nico. And she's the one who found Nico after the accident. What is strange is that she didn't call 911 right away. And she she left initially and then she came back. Uh, that is, she left um, the, the community and then came back. 
Uh, and she doesn't get along with Mason, with whom she shares a workspace. So because of that, she actually switched shifts. Um, that way they don't have to work together. Um, but yeah, she's got some hate Mason <laughs> uh, chemicals running through her brain, so they don't get along. Uh, and she also misses her family a lot. And that comes up. And later on, she, with Mason, are framed by Victor. And then finally, we'll look at Ryan. So she is a technical engineer, and she helped wire the test the coil the way that Nika wanted it. And she was framed for her murder. And it doesn't help that it seemed like she threatened him. She she was actually warning him about the dangers of his, of his experiment. Um, and that sort of got twisted to make it sound like she was threatening him. But really, she was just trying to keep him safe. And she wants to find out the truth as much as Nancy. So those are all of our characters. And now... We'll just talk a bit about the other bits of overlap as far as elements, concepts, locations, things like that. And it's a quick little list. So we've got the idea and location of a science lab. And all three mediums actually happen to include a science lab. Though it's only briefly mentioned in In and Out of Love. And that's where Trevor says he is during the time of Gary's fall. So that's his alibi. Uh, whereas the other two stories, the crime lab case and the deadly device, it's the main location for the mysteries. Then we have entry logs. So again, for In and Out of Love, it's actually kind of important. Um, they are what show that Trevor was at the lab when Gary fell. However, when Nancy checks again with the log, she also learns that the building had to be emptied. So we now have to sort of question the reliability of this log. And then for the game, we have these access logs for anyone who, sorry, these logs for anyone who accessed the lab um, with a card reader and there's an unexplained entry which is blamed on a glitch so we do have this this overlap with the use of entry logs as evidence and also overlap with the first book is photographic evidence so Nancy develops this film of Gary's which shows his final moments and they show who he was with and ultimately this photograph is what proves someone's guilt in the game, photographs are actually used to prove someone's innocence. And in the case of Ryan, because there's photographs of her at a, an award ceremony. And they prove that she couldn't have committed the murder. So, again, overlap used kind of the same way, but also the opposite way. <laughs> uh, but always nice to see uh, when elements are taken from a book and actually used in the game. And the last thing is financial gain as a motive. And this is looking at the second book, The Crime Lab Case and The Game where both culprits are motivated by money to act against the victim. And that's pretty much it for overlap and comparison. So we'll conclude. Uh, the 1997 and 2002 novels provide a general basis for the game that was released in 2012. And that's ultimately the presence of a science lab. And it drives two of the stories, certainly. While the third one, uh, that being In and Out of Love, it provides and then breaks someone's alibi but it's still an important aspect of the story and then her interactive changed many characters and they don't use any of the same names uh, there are a few shared characteristics which is why we do see some overlap so you know that that motivation of money for our culprits is a good example of that and then a lot of events were changed or not included new ones created you know being in this physics lab is very different than either of the books so they're creating new events and you know murder by tesla coil wasn't you know, part of either book and so they, and they chose not to include poisoning um, although that would have worked but it doesn't tie in quite as well as uh, as the tesla coil does um, but they did keep a few small details again from the first book and so that idea of entry logs and photographic evidence and really the big difference we're seeing is the type of science explored varies between the second book and the game. So the book focuses more on using science to solve a crime. And that, you know, that's the purpose of that book. That's the story. So they're using chemistry, uh, DNA is being looked at, forensic angles of things, whereas the book is about physics and electricity. So very different types of science. But nonetheless, it's very clear that her interactive was inspired by that book, The Crime Lab Case, for their own science-based story, even if it differed quite a bit. And really, they did a tremendous job, even though the game doesn't really match up with either of their source material. We can still see where they got their ideas from, even if just a slim basis. 
And that is my comparison. So pretty interesting stories. Um, a lot of science for that second book. And of course the game, not so much in the first book. But we do see where her interactive incorporated some ideas. I was expecting more. Um, I sort of thought if her interactive is actually saying that they're basing a game off of two books and clearly they're, they've actually taken stuff from both books more than just a minor detail. And I was maybe halfway through the book, um, In and Out of Love, maybe even further before I started to see where some of the overlap was. Like it's very minor. Again, it's the photographic evidence, um, the idea of a science lab, even though it doesn't play a big role, but it kind of does. Um, the entry log, very small details. But they were incorporated. Her interactive did do that, and I'd like to think that was intentional. So it was purposeful. They, they could rightly claim that the deadly device is partially based off of In and Out of Love. And it's much more obvious in terms of the crime lab case simply because of location, being in a lab, although the labs differ completely. Um, but her interactive, I think they knew how many people wanted a game based off of this book. I remember that popularity when this game came out, or rather when the book came out. And lots of people saying, oh, we would love to see a game based off of this book. So that's what her interactive did. They changed it a great deal. <laughs> um, but they were able to uh, create a wonderful story based on a lab. Science being our main subject, even though it, it's very different from that explored in the book. So I'm going to wrap things up. Um, and before I finish, this, I do just want to reiterate again, uh, for those of you who may struggle with suicidal ideation or know anyone who does, um, please be aware that there are outlets out there. And in Canada, again, we do have that new suicide crisis helpline. That's 988. That's all you have to dial. No area code needed. Simply 988. It's toll free. Please be sure to use it if you need it, as well as to pass it on if you think there's someone else who may need it but isn't ready to talk to someone they know. And uh, and if there are other struggles with mental health, there are other outlets out there as well. Uh, again, in Canada, we have the Kids Help Phone. Also check with your health authority. We have many across the country, so I can't list all of those. And again, for people in other countries, I'm hoping you've got these, uh, these sources and uh, outlets available to you as well. So thank you everyone for taking the time to watch and or listen to this comparison video for The Deadly Device and the two books that inspired it, In and Out of Love and The Crime Lab Case. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.